Okay, we're back for our second video in our series going through the early SDA use of the word person and its variants. Now, as I covered in the first video, the reason we're doing this is because Ellen White identified the personality of God as being one of our pillar doctrines in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Now, even though if you were to go and Google a list of pillar doctrines today, you don't usually find the personality of God listed among our pillar doctrines. But it's a really important thing to be aware of really what this pillar doctrine is, not only what it is, but even just the fact that there is a pillar doctrine known as the personality of God. But then, well, but what is it, right? And in the writings of the early pioneers, you find a lot of statements, a lot of phrases like God is a person, God has a personality, um, God is a personal being, and that sort of thing. And as I mentioned in the first video, the reason it's important to be doing this series of videos and to be examining the early SDA use of the word person to see what did they mean when they said things like God is a person, God is a personal being, is because if we don't have the same meaning in mind for the word person that the early pioneers had in mind, when we read what they wrote, even if what they wrote is very clear, we may bring our idea of what it means to be a person to the investigation, right? To our experience of reading what the pioneers wrote. But if we don't have the same meaning in mind, it could really cause us to misunderstand what they are saying. So that's why we're looking at how they used the word to see what do they identify as being what a person consists of or what does it mean to be a person. Now, there's a little, there's a short story um, that I, I just have to share with you to illustrate the importance of this point true story this is something from years ago something that happened to me years ago i was talking to a friend of mine in alaska and um and of course you know in alaska they get a lot of snow and it stays for months and months well i'm originally from missouri and i was living in missouri at the time and so i'm talking to this person and they say something about their dad bought a snow machine Okay, well, that seems like a simple enough statement, right? They bought a snow machine. Okay, well, just to let you know where I'm from, we would get snow, you know, every winter pretty much, but it usually doesn't stick around for very long. Not like in Alaska, that's for sure. Okay, so even though we get snow, it wouldn't be there for long. So snow sports really wasn't a thing where I was from. Even though we did have um nearby there was a small business that did downhill snow skiing in the winter they had a snow um th this machine that manufactures snow and they would spray snow on the hillside in order to facilitate downhill snow skiing right because without that there wouldn't be enough snow to snow ski so when my friend said their dad recently bought a snow machine, of course, that's exactly what I had in mind. That's what I thought they must mean by snow machine. So imagine how weird that must have been for me, right? To think, why are you buying a snow machine if you live where there's lots of snow and it sticks around for a long time? So I asked him, I said, oh, a snow machine, really? Well, that's interesting. Like, what are you going to do with that? Because I'm thinking, where where would they need to shoot any manufactured snow? Isn't there snow everywhere? <laughs> I mean, I was even really, I was really trying to wrap my mind around it and thinking, did they manufacture snowballs or something? Like, because my friend, they, they were saying like, well, snow machines are a lot of fun. And then they said, well, almost everyone has one. And I thought, you're not the only one? What? Like, what are all you people doing in Alaska with snow machines? <laughs> so anyway, this went on for a little while and it was starting to actually cause a bit of a strain in the conversation, as you might imagine, because they're thinking, 
it should be really, really obvious what I mean by snow machine. Like, come on, Teresa, what are you doing? Like, don't you get it? And I'm thinking, wow, I'm really trying to understand. Like, I don't understand why anyone would want a snow machine when they live where there's all this snow. Well, finally, we figured out what the problem was. And what they call a snow machine is what I would call a snowmobile. And obviously for me, a snow machine is something that is very different from what they had in mind, what they meant by the word snow machine. So you can see, I mean, that's a really practical illustration of why it's so important for us to make sure that we have the same understanding of words. I mean, it might seem like a simple word, snow machine. That's a pretty simple phrase, right? But such a radical difference in understanding between the two of us. And I was not able to understand what they were telling me and they couldn't figure out why I was being so slow about it. So anyway, um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at what David Arnold had to say about God being a person. What did it mean to David Arnold for God to be a person? And um, I'll tell you just a little bit about David Arnold. We're not going to get into a big biographical sketch of David Arnold, but here's a picture of where um, Ellen White and her husband and Joseph Bates and Hiram Edson and, and a few other people, they were here at a conference, a meeting that they had um, in 1848. This is at David Arnold's place. And, um, and incidentally, like years later, or early 1860s, when the SDA movement was officially organized, uh, he was the first president of the New York conference. So he definitely held, you know, um, an active role within the SDA movement. But now this, this meeting or this conference held at his place in 1848, the circumstances of that were that, um, you know, when people were looking for Jesus to come back in 1844, it wasn't that there was a new organized movement of Adventist believers that formed. People weren't leaving their churches um, expecting to become a, a new denomination. It was just various people in various denominations who still had their different denominational views, but they all, those who accepted William Miller's message, they all agreed on this point that Jesus was coming back personally in 1844. So um, after the disappointment in 1844, you can imagine that various Adventists now were like, well, what do we do? And and so anyway. There was a whole bunch of Adventists scattered around. And so this conference was one of many conferences held that year where Ellen and James and a few others would go to meet with the scattered Adventist people and try to uh, bring them into harmony, bring them up to speed with present truth. Because, of course, by now, um, the pillar doctrines had been firmly established and there was this small company of people who emerged out of that Adventist movement who went forward and accepted that Ellen White had become, um, had been called to bear a message. So they still had their various views. So Ellen White describes that. She says that there was about 35 people, 35 Adventists present at this meeting and that they all held erroneous and discordant views. She said barely two of them agreed on anything. And so while they were there in, in this circumstance, Ellen White got really distressed and she ended up fainting. Well, then they prayed for her and she revived and immediately she was taken into vision. And then she describes that. She says that um, she took a Bible and now this wasn't um, that other really heavy Bible, the 18 pound Bible that she held up at arm's length for like two hours while in vision. This is a different time and a different Bible. It's uh, just a regular sized Bible, but she held it up over her head, just like the other one, you know, and she was pointing with her other hand to the passages that 
she was explaining while in vision um, and she couldn't see it, but, but everyone around her could see that she was pointing at the very passages that she was talking about. So while she was in vision, she was being shown the truth of certain scriptures for the very purpose of correcting some of the errors of those present. And she describes that a bit in one of her books. Um, she describes it in more than one place. But anyway, we'll be looking at how she describes it in Life Sketches of James and Ellen G. White, 1880. So here's what she says. She says, my accompanying angel presented before me some of the errors of those present and also the truth in contrast with their errors that these discordant views, which they claimed to be according to the Bible, were only according to their opinion of the Bible, and that they must yield their errors and unite upon the third angel's message. Our meeting ended victoriously. Truth gained the victory. Those who held the strange diversity of errors there confessed them and united upon the third angel's message of present truth, and God greatly blessed them and added many to their numbers. Okay, now, why did I quote this? Why did I share this with you? Well, one of the main reasons is because, as you see, she mentions that those who were at the meeting at David Arnold's place, those who held the strange diversity of errors, there confessed them and united upon the third angel's message of present truth. Well, she also specifically names David Arnold as one of those who held erroneous views. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of that just because it, it's not relevant for this topic and we have a lot to cover, but you can go to the book and you can read the fuller context and get a bigger picture of what was happening. If you know, if you'd like. And I think it's a wonderful history to be um, familiar with. Now, but notice here, so David Arnold had been one of those who held some erroneous views. But after this experience, after Ellen White was taken in vision and God revealed to her the truth to correct the errors of those present, those who held those strange diversity of errors confessed them right then and there. They confessed their errors and they united upon the third angel's message of present truth. Now that's significant because in the first video, we saw a little bit about not only did Ellen White name the personality of God as one of the pillars of our faith, but she called for the reprinting of the articles written by the SDA pioneers on this topic. And you can see here that she says that, um, let the aged men who were pioneers in our work speak plainly. Of course, some of the pioneers were still alive, so they could speak plainly when she was calling for this to be done in 1905. But she also says, and let those who are dead speak also by reprinting of their articles in our periodicals. Okay, well now, obviously, we can see that she's endorsing their articles. Now, David Arnold is one of those pioneers who wrote on the personality of God, who she also names specifically as having come into harmony with the pillar doctrines, even though she says more broadly, all the... Uh, the brethren came into harmony. We saw that in the first video. But anyway, um, we will go ahead and move on now and start seeing what did David Arnold say about God being a person? What did he mean by person? Okay, so we'll start off here. Now, um, I have the link, I will have the link in the description uh, for this video, I'll have the link to his article where you can see the PDF, the original PDF of this Review and Herald issue, and you can read the full article there to get the bigger picture. I'm just going to be looking at, I think, like three paragraphs from it, but it'll be more than enough to establish what he meant by the word person. So I'll just read it first, and then we'll come back and we'll look at it more closely. He says, Spiritualism has commenced with the supreme ruler of the universe and incorporated into its creed that he is without body or parts, while the word shows that he is a person, 
has hands, feet, eyes, ears, a heart, etc., and that he handles, walks, sees, speaks, breathes, and sits upon a throne. Moses tells us in his record of the creation that God created man in his own image. Now, this was not, as spiritualizers tell us, in the image of his purity or holiness, for these are not tangible shapes or forms of which images can be created. Paul also tells us, Hebrews 1.3, that Christ is the express image of his Father's person. O thou destroyer, what hast thou done thus to cover the earth with darkness and the people with gross darkness? Thou hast not only made the supreme appear altogether such an one as he is not, but thou hast placed or sung of a heaven beyond the bounds of time and space of disembodied spirits, or of localities without a location or forms without figure. Thou hast not only robbed God of his glory and identity, but heaven of its locality and beauty, angels of their bodies, with which they visited Abraham, Lot, and others, they ate, drank, walked, and talked. Christ of personality, the earth of its restitution and loveliness, the resurrection of its materiality, the city of the living God of its foundation, the son of David of his kingdom, and the saints of their everlasting inheritance. In addition to this sacrilege, spiritualism has taken from Satan his personality and given him an existence only in the shape of the carnal propensities of fallen man. Okay, now let's go back to the first paragraph and we'll start looking at this in a little bit more detail. Now, the fact that David Arnold contrasts what spiritualism says with what the word shows, shows that, that when spiritualism says this, the word says something different, okay? So he says, spiritualism has commenced with the supreme ruler of the universe and incorporated into its creeds, spiritualism's creed, that he, the supreme ruler of the universe or God, that he is without body or parts. Now, okay, so spiritualism says God is without body or parts. In contrast, on the other hand, he says, while the word shows that he, that God, that he is a person. So right off the bat, we can see that for him to contrast being a person with what spiritualism says about God having no body or parts, the contrast is that a person has a body or parts, a body and parts. And he makes that really clear with what immediately follows. He says, while the word shows that he is a person, has hands, feet, eyes, ears, a heart, etc., and that he does all the things that persons do, that bodies do, handles, walks, sees, speaks, breathes, and sits on things, right? And notice that it's not just David Arnold giving his personal opinion about what he thinks it means to be a person. He's not trying to give his personal opinion He's pointing to what the word shows about God and that the word shows that God is a person. The word shows that God has all these body parts and that he does things that bodies do. Okay. So we can see right there that his use of the word person is that a person has a body and parts. Then he goes on and he says, Moses tells us in his record of the creation that God created man in his own image. Now notice this, he says, now this was not as spiritualizers tell us in the image of his purity or holiness. So this whole being created in God's image, David Arnold is saying, spiritualizers say, that being in God's image is being in the image of his purity or holiness. So character traits. They're saying that's what it means to be made in the image of God. He says, no, that's not it. David Arnold is disagreeing with that idea, right? 
He says it's not as spiritualizers tell us in the image of his purity or holiness. And why? He gives the reason for these purity or holiness. These are not tangible shapes or forms of which images can be created. Okay, so for God to be a person, he's pointing to the word saying that a person has a body and parts and is a tangible shape, has a tangible form. And then he points to Hebrews 1, 3, where it says Christ is the express image of his father's person. Okay, now this whole thing, there's more, obviously, I've already read it. We'll be going back um, to look at what follows after this. But before I move on to the next slide, I just want to bring in something else here because as we will see throughout the series um, that we'll be having on the early SDA use of the word person and its variants, and this is a significant point that'll become more obvious why it's significant as we go in, through the series. But early SDAs used the word person and the word being synonymously. They used person and being to mean the same thing. Now, David Arnold did this, and in this other article by him, it's called A Double Entity, and I'll have a link in the description. It's a super short article, but it's really, really good. And you can see here, and I'll just change the color so that it's a little bit more obvious, um, how he's giving a description of, at the top there, what a person is. A person has hands, uh, feet, eyes, ears, a heart, etc. But then notice at the bottom that real beings having eyes, hands, feet, and all the other organs necessary to constitute real beings. Now, his description of a being and his description of a person, as you can see, are pretty much the same, having a body and parts. So, um, yeah, just keep that in mind. We'll see a, a lot more of this over the course of the various um, episodes that I'll be making for this series. But anyway, now to go back to this part of the quote, a lot of the pioneers referred to Hebrews 1, 3 when they were writing about the doctrine of the personality of God. And Ellen White did as well. So I want to mention just a little bit here from one of her books, a very early book, 1851, and it's called A Sketch of the Christian Experience and Views of Ellen G. White. Now, notice some of the similarities in what she has to say and what David Arnold has to say. And one of the reasons I wanted to share what Ellen White had to say in connection with this is because, you know, even though we've seen that she endorsed the articles written by the pioneers on the topic of the personality of God, there's still a tendency um, with a, a lot of people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church to pretty much just want to know what Ellen White said, you know, like there's um, more of a readiness to go with whatever Ellen White said versus what the pioneers wrote on certain things. And it's not that I'm trying to say the pioneers had an infallible knowledge of scriptures or anything like that. She did have to correct them on a few things, but like I said, she endorsed their articles on the personality of God. So on this topic, at least, when we read their articles on the personality of God, we can know that she endorsed their teachings on this topic. But still, it's really cool to see what she had to say on it as well. So here's just one statement. She says, I have frequently been falsely charged with teaching views peculiar to spiritualism. Okay, so notice how she's starting off framing this in the context of spiritualism, just like David Arnold did when he says spiritualism has commenced with the supreme ruler of the universe and incorporated into its creed that he is without body or parts, right? So she says she has frequently been falsely charged with teaching views peculiar to spiritualism. In other words, uniquely, you know, spiritualistic type doctrines. 
But before the editor of the Day Star run into that delusion, I'm not going to get into who he was in this episode, but we will be looking at who he was in future episodes. But she says before he run into that delusion, the Lord gave her a view of the sad and desolating effects that would be produced upon the flock by him and others in teaching the spiritual views. Okay, so she frames this in light of spiritualism and spiritual views. So we can see here that the spiritual views are what she's referring to as spiritualism because it's a delusion that the editor of the Day Star ended up falling into. She says before he did that, God showed her some of the sad and desolating effects that would be produced upon the flock in teaching spiritual views. Then she says, I have often seen the lovely Jesus that he is a person. So with David Arnold, he's saying spiritualism says God has no body or parts, but the word shows God is a person. Now she says, Ellen White says that spiritualism uh, has sad and desolating effects. The spiritual views have da- sad and desolating effects on people. But she has often seen the lovely Jesus that he is a person. Okay, now that, that doesn't tell us yet what she meant by person, but you see here that she's setting up a contrast between the spiritual views and the truth that Jesus is a person. Now notice this. She says, I asked him, Jesus, I asked him if his father was a person and had a form like himself said jesus i am in the express image of my father's person now she italicized the word image there that's original to the publication but notice here that she sets up their spiritual views their spiritualism and she's been falsely accused of teaching those views but so obviously she doesn't but what she does teach is what she, she was shown by god that jesus is a person and she asked jesus if his father was a person in other words does your father have a form like you do that's what she's asking jesus is your father a person with a form like yours jesus answers her and says notice he doesn't say oh you know that's off limits you shouldn't ask me about that no he says i am in the express image of my father's person he he is basically quoting scripture right then ella white goes on to say that she has often seen that the spiritual view took away all the glory of heaven and that in many minds the throne of david and the lovely person of jesus had been burned up in the fire of spiritualism she goes on to say i have seen that some who have been deceived and led into this error would be brought out into the light of truth but it would be almost impossible for them to get entirely rid of the deceptive power of spiritualism. Such should make thorough work in confessing their errors and leaving them forever. There's a whole lot here, but I hope that like the importance of this is ringing loudly right now in your ears. Notice what she says. She says that some who have been led into the error of spiritualism will be brought out of it. They'll be brought out into the light of truth, but it would be almost impossible for them to get entirely rid of the deceptive power of spiritualism. Such those who have had it exposed, have been brought out into the light of truth. Such should make thorough work in confessing their errors and leaving them forever. Spiritualism is one of the most effective deceptions of Satan. And I mean, it takes such a manifold form. Spiritualism isn't just the teaching of the conscious state of the dead. I mean, notice here, 
There's nothing about the conscious state of the dead anywhere in this context, nor was David Arnold um, pointing to the conscious state of the dead when he's describing spiritualism, saying that the supreme ruler of the universe is without body or parts. It's still spiritualism, but it's just that spiritualism is more broad than just the conscious state of the dead. So that's a really important point. And I know when I was first learning about this, it wasn't just immediately super obvious to me why teaching that God is without body or parts was spiritualism, because I had been under the impression for most of my life that spiritualism had to deal with ghosts, the idea that ghosts are real, or the idea that, you know, the dead have um, a conscious existence and that sort of thing. But notice that's just not the um, spiritualism is not that narrow. It's broader than that. And it's really important to make thorough work in confessing our errors if we've held uh, spiritualistic views, even if we didn't realize they were spiritualistic, it's important to confess the, the, those errors and leave them forever. Okay, so let's, um, well, actually, before I go back to David Arnold, I just want to make sure that it was actually um, clearly stated how this shows us at least one instance of where we can see what Ellen White meant by the word person. She asked Jesus if his father was a person like himself. In other words, does your father have a form? So to be a person means you have a form. Okay. And Jesus says, yep, my father uh, is a person. I'm the express image of his person. Okay. So let's back up now and we'll continue on with David Arnold's article. And we'll move forward to this last section. He says, O thou destroyer. And remember, this is in the context of spiritualism. So who's the destroyer? Spiritualism. O thou destroyer, what hast thou done thus to cover the earth with darkness and the people with gross darkness? And then he goes on to say what spiritualism has done. Spiritualism has made the Supreme appear altogether such a one as he is not. And we saw previously that spiritualism says, God has no body or parts. He's saying, no, that's portraying the Supreme in a way that isn't true, uh, making him appear altogether such an one as he is not, and has placed her song of a heaven beyond the bounds of time and space. Now, notice how he then says, or of localities without a location. He says, heaven, you know, beyond the bounds of time and space, and disembodied spirits. And then he does kind of like a parallel statement there of both of those things by saying, or of localities without a location or forms without figure. So the whole idea of heaven being beyond the bounds of time and space is the idea of localities without a location, right? Because if you think of heaven as being somewhere, but then it's not bound by time or space. It doesn't exist in time anywhere and it doesn't exist anywhere in space. So there's no material existence according to the teachings of spiritualism. There's no material existence for a place called heaven. It's a locality without a location, right? Then similarly with disembodied spirits, spiritualism sings or has, you know, written poems and songs. He's referring to um, Charles Wesley's hymns. He has a few hymns that uses the phrase beyond the bounds of time and space. You can check that out if you're into history and that sort of thing. But anyway, this whole idea of disembodied spirits is what he refers to as forms without figure. So it's kind of like you think of it still as having a form, but not really. It's not tangible. It's not material, right? So the body is said to be material, but then the spirit is something that's said to be immaterial, at least according to spiritualism. And if it's not in the body, it's disembodied. 
And that's what spiritualism says about the supreme ruler of the universe, that God is a disembodied spirit or that just God is an unembodied spirit, an immaterial spirit, a form without a tangible figure. And David Arnold says, you know, spiritualism, O thou destroyer, thou hast not only robbed God of his glory and identity, but spiritualism is guilty of a whole list of robberies, but heaven of its locality and beauty, angels of their bodies, Christ of personality, the earth of its restitution and loveliness, the resurrection of its materiality, et cetera, et cetera, right? He, he goes on with this list and you'll notice everything about this is dealing with spiritualism robbing things of their materiality and only giving them an existence in a spiritual or non-physical sense. Now, this idea of heaven being beyond the bounds of time and space, as spiritualism states, or of being uh, a locality without a location, is something that Ellen White also commented on, again, in a letter to John Harvey Kellogg. She wrote to him and she was trying to correct him on his spiritualistic teachings about God's personhood. And she had told him, heaven is not a vapor, it is a place. And she underlined the word place. That's original to her letter to John Harvey Kellogg. So we can see here again, that Ellen White is saying the same sort of thing. The heaven isn't just some, some kind of vapor, like beyond the bounds of time and space. It's not a vapor everywhere present and kind of nowhere in particular. It's a location. It's a place. All right. Now, after David Arnold writes about this whole list of robberies. He says, in addition to this sacrilege, spiritualism has taken from Satan his personality and given him an existence only in the shape of the carnal propensities of fallen man. So here again, we see that he's saying that spiritualism also is taking from Satan his personhood, right? And we can, we can know that because it says taken from Satan, his personality and given him an existence only in the shape of the carnal propensities of fallen man. So when we see this whole list of robberies and see that they're all dealing with the materiality of places and people and, um, planets, even, you know, the earth is going to be restored. And people are going to be resurrected with physical bodies, just like Christ was resurrected from the dead with a literal tangible body of flesh and bones. We saw that in the first video. And um, of course, it's in the scriptures. But anyway, uh, we talked about that in the first video. So you can look, about, uh, look back at that if you haven't seen that one yet and get a little bit more of that history and context. But we see here that he's describing personality as personhood, the actual tangible form of a person. All right. Now it's noteworthy. Um, it's worth taking a look here real quick at Ellen White's statement from early writings. You know, she shared David Arnold's materialistic view of Satan's person. This is from early writings, page 152. Notice she says, I was shown Satan as he once was a happy, exalted angel. Then I was shown him as he now is. He still bears a kingly form. His features are still noble for he is an angel fallen. But the expression of his countenance is full of anxiety, care, unhappiness, malice, hate, mischief, deceit, and every evil. The brow, which was once so noble, I particularly noticed. Now, why did she particularly notice his brow? Well, because his forehead commenced from his eyes to recede. In other words, it wasn't going up straight anymore. It was starting to recede. I saw that he had so long bent himself to evil that every good quality was debased and every evil trait was developed. Now, she is describing some of his character traits. But notice, she's describing his physical form. 
And of course, his form is reflecting his character traits. His countenance is full of anxiety, care, happiness, malice, hate, mischief, deceit, and every evil. Anyway, she goes on to say, his eyes were cunning and sly and showed great penetration. His frame was large, but the flesh hung loosely about his hands and face. Now, wait a minute. Quite clearly, she is describing a material being because Satan was shown to her to have flesh that was hanging loosely about his hands and face because of having been so long degenerating in his uh, sinful state. His frame was large, but the flesh hung loosely about his hands and face. As I beheld him, his chin was resting upon his left hand. He appeared to be in deep thought. A smile was upon his countenance, which made me tremble. It was so full of evil and satanic slyness. This smile is the one he wears just before he makes sure of his victim. And as he fastens the victim in his snare, this smile grows horrible. Now, clearly she's describing a physical being and it's worth mentioning that Satan is the one behind spiritualism. He would love nothing more for people to spiritualize away his very existence because spiritualizing away his existence, well, it's very easy then to take the next step and spiritualize away the existence of God, uh, Christ, heaven, angels, the resurrection, everything. Okay, so as we've seen so far, this started off with David Arnold saying that spiritualism has incorporated into its creed that God is without body or parts, while the word shows that God is a person. Then he talks about the various robberies of spiritualism and how spiritualism just is a destroyer. It destroys the supreme ruler of the universe. It destroys heaven. It robs heaven of locality. It robs God of his glory and identity, angels of their bodies, Christ of his body, of his personhood. Spiritualism even has taken from Satan his existence as a tangible being, right? So what we can see from these three paragraphs of the article, Repology Explained, David Arnold was using the word person and personality to refer to the material bodily existence of a being, a person. He used the same uh, description to identify what a person is that he used to identify what a real being is. So that covers it for what we'll, co um, what we'll talk about in this episode of the series, going through the early SDA use of the word person and its variants. And again, David Arnold did write more about the personality of God, and I'll include links in the description. And the next time we'll be looking at um, the pioneer Joseph Bates, and we'll be seeing how he used the word person and its variants when he was describing um, what it means for God to be a person and that sort of thing. I hope you come back for that. We have a whole lot more to cover, and I, I hope that you're really enjoying the series so far. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.